Welcome to the South African Civil Society Information Service. I'm Fazila Farouk in Johannesburg. South Africa's ruling party abandoned the notion of a pro-poor democracy way back in 1994. In fact, some social justice activists argue that they abandoned the poor in the negotiations that led and ushered in our era of democracy. There's been a reliance on the markets to redress the injustices of the past. Poor people who come to the cities do not have a place to live. The apartheid city landscape is still very much intact. Poor South Africans, 20 years into our democracy, poor and predominantly black people still live largely on the peripheries of urban areas in shack settlements or in townships and these places have simply become neglected ghettos. The transformation of the apartheid landscape is long overdue, yet it seems that our government simply does not have a plan to house poor people, particularly poor black people, when they come to the cities looking for opportunities and for jobs. One woman who has been at the forefront of that struggle at the coalface of our democracy is Bandile Madlelosi, and we're talking to her today. Welcome to Saxus, Bandile. A pleasure. Bandile, you're a housing activist, and you are the general secretary of the social movement Abishlali Basenjondolo. It's a social movement which can also be referred to as the Shack Dwellers Movement. Sure. I understand you've got 12,000 members in 60 informal settlements around the country. Bandile, I, I'd like to talk to you about your involvement um, in the Shack Dwellers Movement. How is it that you got involved with uh, Abishlali Basenjondolo? You're a very young woman. <laughs> Um, you've rose up the ranks very quickly. You're now General Secretary of the organization. When did you join? Why are you engaged uh, as a housing activist in South Africa? Uh, thank you very much, Fazila, for inviting me uh, today. So it was 2009 when Abatlali was attacked and they had to appear in court. So I went with my mom to court to support her. So when I went there, I met this young boy called Mazun Dimande, who shared with me what is about that, because I wanted to get more knowledge. I saw red t-shirt people, so united. I wanted to get more information, who is about that, what, is, what are they doing? And Mazun shared to me that about that was a social movement, it's an, uh, not affiliated with political parties, and which I've seen it as a, as a right platform for me as a, a community person who I can be able to get more knowledge and also get knowledge, knowledge about my rights. And they told me that they work with informal settlement. I was struck by their work they do. And uh, I joined the movement. Mazu also was struck by my knowledge and wanted me to empower other young women within the organization because of my community work that I was doing in my community. So that's how I joined Abatlan in 2009. When I joined Abatlal, I was very bl not much educated. I had only the love of the community and wanting to help the community to better the lives of the people. Yes, it's all about being in solidarity with the shack dwellers, but most of all, it's also about me learning more about shack dwellers, which to the extent that I, when I joined the movement, I started to go into staying in different communities, trying to understand more about the lives in informal settlement because I've always lived my life in a township. So I've never experienced it. It was when I experienced the life in Sheik that I began to... So you gave up your life of living in a proper house in a township? Yes. To go and live with people that live in Sheik? Yes. I see. I did not have a permanent... I did not leave my home and, did, and went to have a permanent house in informal settlement to increase the number of Sheik dwellers. But I was, uh, I was accommodated by the families in informal settlement in Kennedy Road, in uh, Kennedy Road, Isipingo, Umlazi. I went to different settlements at a very long number of uh, months because I had to stay six months and upwards, trying to understand more about that community because they, you can't speak too much about the community that you've, you've never bonded with and you don't know the challenges. You, don't, you only know them by theory. And then I went to these communities. It was only then I realized that 
after my father left in me in 1998 and when poverty struck at home i've began to live the life in shake but because of my home was built with bricks i did not realize that i was living in shake i seen the different because of the material of of our building the difference that a shake is only built with metals and mud and a, a proper house is built with uh, bricks but i didn't realize that going beyond the shelter what what consists of a shack it's all about services that dignity is respected something that it have never happened to me because our dignity was not respected we are humiliated when the, our water service was cut when our electricity was cut we became the show of the community one house amongst hundreds in my area was dark it became it was, there was a stop uh, uh, next to my house the taxi stop it was it became a, a well known taxi stop to say in the dark house the house that doesn't have electricity you know because it became the show of the community i be, i was very young then but i felt that humiliation but i had to live with it it was only then when i joined abatlali and then i realized more and get to realize more about all my life that i was living that i was living a lie of not understanding what is a shake and actually i was very angry that i was living in a shake because I, the water and electricity is not needed by me but my life needs water and electricity and if the municipality cut water and electricity how do they expect me to survive those are the kind of things that i began to critically analyze and and question in when i joined the movement in uh, 2010 i started uh, i was elected as the first young general secretary in the movement and from 2011 i was re elected again and this year we are going for another elections for another agm because I w the leadership is elected in my organization so part of the strategy that your organization employs is to go out onto the streets and protest for better housing can you tell us a little bit about that when well, it does not start there my organization's role is to bring the people to the government and the government to the people Yes, the movement was formed out of anger, hunger, and frustration, which led to the road blockade in 2005. That is how the movement was formed. But furthermore, what we do before protest, we engage with the government. We have several meetings of meaningful engagement, try to find the resolutions. The ignorance of the government leads us to protest. The lies that is being always told to us leads us to go to taking it to street because the anger continues when people tell us lies when our when our frustration and demands are ignored when our rights are being violated that's when people uh, uh, take to streets because we we lose hope to the government and we have no other person to cry to besides to express our anger in the manner that has been going on uh, these months and the other thing people come from rural areas to stay in shacks because rural areas is is don't have jobs matriculants this year matriculants are finishing school they're going to come to 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 urban areas to get jobs to access into universities others who are who are in universities are coming out they are going back into informal settlement so those are the challenges that increases the informal settlement yet at the same time your organization has been in the news for heavy repression from our state particularly through the police i'd like you to tell us the story of ngobile nzuza she is a young 17 year old school girl who was shot at the back of her head and killed early last month while she was out on the street protesting for housing in her community can you tell us her story in the issue of ngobile nzuza ngobile nzuza is one of the community children young people in Keto Crest Keto Crest have been facing illegal evictions from this year early they joined the movement in April and they've been targeted and isolated and intimidated for their involvement with the movement leaders have been dead like Enkulule Gokwala for being a housing rights activist and and uh, and also investigating and uh, uh, fighting against the ongoing corruption of houses and misallocation of people within the community of Keto Crest people have been evicted as said so with the matter have been going to court first of all the municipality came 
I think it's around August, demolished people's houses, left them homeless with a court order that was that they received in 28 March. We went straight to court to defend our rights as residents. The court order protected our rights and gave a court order which interdicts the municipality from evicting people and demolishing their homes and also coming to the air. The following day, the municipality came. This, we showed them the court order they did not comply with it. They went on and demolished. They, had, they were very, they were carrying very big guns. In, we went to court five times. Afternoon, we rebelled. We went to court in the very same afternoon. There's another court order that was issued. There's another demolishing of the houses after two days. So it became a game. We go to court, we build, they come, they demolish. Until, until Ngomezulu was shot by the municipality uh, land invasion units. Was shot four times in the stomach and still struggling for his life. The anger of the community increased. Now they wanted to take on streets because they can't comply with the court order. We've protested on, on September, demanding the investigation of houses, the end of, of evictions, the municipality to comply with the court orders. We, it was on September 16. Unfortunately, none of it was respected. We followed the legal route of application for the court order. We had a very peaceful protest, which, were, which took from uh, Borders Park to City Hall. A memorandum was handed over and we requested for demands after seven days. After seven days, as usual, there was no response of the demands. So the, the, and the people said that we do have a plan B if our demands are not respected and if the municipalities keep on coming to our areas. And of course, the municipality tested the people. They came and demolished the houses. They did not respond to the memorandum. Then the people take on street because they had, they had no hope in anyone to, to go to. Ngobi Lenzuza was part of that protest at 4 o'clock. Around half past 3, the protest started in the morning. It was the time when everyone was starting to prepare to work and the time when the township taxes are, are starting to go uh, to town. Let me just interrupt you there because I want you to explain to people that 4 o'clock in the morning in township areas is actually the beginning of peak hour traffic. And I wanted to highlight that because I think a lot of middle class people living in, the, in, in suburban areas don't really understand how difficult it is to get to work that 4 a.m. in the morning is actually peak hour traffic because that's when people are getting up in the townships and making their way to work. Of and that's when you started your protest. Yes. Of course, yes. We call it a, we call the protest the tires protest the Dunlop. And of course, yes, we 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 hired Dunlop because that's what we do. We say we hired Dunlop. We hired Dunlop at, at the times of the peak hours, where everyone is starting to prepare to work and go to work. And because of we want to send our expression and our anger to be known, that is the time where we want to disturb and ask to be noticed and our voices to be heard and the road blockade the road at around those, at around those peak hours time, where also Mobile was part of it at around 4 o'clock. And this was around 4 o'clock when the bent tires, they, they closed the roads. The police came with the station commander of Keto Crest, known as Keto. Uh, the station commander was wearing a private clothes, not, which showed that he was not on duty. He came with other policemen the community started to run away from the from the where the road located the road. They started to run away. They went inside the the suburbs in the, next to the area of informal settlement, running away from the police. The police followed them, and then it was then when the station commander told the people to stop and lie down. Others they stood, and when they stopped running. The station commander of Keto Crest, who is station commander Mganga, took out a gun and shot at Ngobile at the back. Ngobile died in the scene. It was not only Ngobile, there's another woman who was also shot, and the others, when they had the gun shot, the others ran away because they were trying to comply with the police, ensuring that we, we, we're not causing any violence. Ngobile was a very young child, uh, doing great. Uh, was doing standard eight, which is grade ten. Ngobile had a very good future in life. A lot of things was expected out of her. She was harmless. She was, there was no weapon she was carrying. 
No weapon was found in the scene, no nothing. And she was killed. Just for fighting for her rights, the right to the city, the right to home, the right to freedom of expression. Her right was taken down into silence of death. The silence of death is very highly, is very high in Keto Crest. You are told in Keto Crest, you are told that you are next. There's a, a, there's a database list of death, death database list, I call it like that in Keto Crest, where we are intimidated and told that you are next on the list. And trust me, once you are next on the list, there's no doubt. We first doubted it when it was first term course Kumbela, who was on the first on the list, they killed him, Kumbela shot him. Secondly, Kurulego, who was always saying that I'm on the list, Kurulego died. Ngomezulu came to us after Kurulego was shot and said, I'm intimidated, I'm told that I'm next on the list. Charges of intimidation were open, no investigation, no nothing. And then the land division shot, uh, uh, shot uh, Ngomezulu. Again, the, the community was told that if they continue with this nonsense... Just explain <coughs> for the viewers, what is the land invasion unit? Uh, the land invasion unit is the, I would say, there's a security management which carries guns and it's like securities or metropolis of the municipality. The land invasion unit is the demolishers. They demolish, they say they demolish all shakes. It's the very part, I could say, the red ends because there's a, you know, people who just come to demolish. That's, the, that's their truth, to demolish houses. And they work for government? They work for the government because it's the municipality land invasion unit. Even the cars they come with is a municipality sticker and it's recent land invasion unit. So let's go back to the story of uh, Ngobile. Um, she was shot dead. True. Then you went to the scene. Tell us what happened when you went to the scene. It was a call from the community that I had to leave home and, and rush because they wanted, they were very scared of their lives. The intimidation was still going on where the police was coming over and over saying that they will come and, and kill them and shoot them. And because of the experience of Ngobile who was already shot, they feared. They wanted me to come and assist. Of course, I did not come with any gun. I did not have anything, but because of my passion and love of the people, I was there to die with the people, be there with them. If they, if, if they are dying, let us all die. We are all one in this. I went to the community at Keto Crest. I found the innocent Ngobile lying there. I was, was around six when I arrived. The poor Ngobile was lying there. None she of, was lying on the road. She was lying on the road. They, uh, they put uh, this sail on, on her, lying on the road waiting for the car to pick her up, the Moshari car. The Moshari car came at nine after I intervened and tried to call like, the poor child have been there from four o'clock. Yes, he's dead, but he's still a human being. So the car came at around nine o'clock. And when the car came, actually I was the first in the leadership to go there. My reason to this was to be part of the people, pro protect their rights, and also be in solidarity with Mobile's family who have lost Mobile. At around half past nine, we were engaged in a, in a, in a protest which was demanding that the station commander who shot Mobile to be arrested. The protest was very peaceful. No burning of tires was there, was done. We are just singing songs and slogans which wants to do away with the station commander and demanding the station commander to be arrested because everyone saw that it was him. Everyone witnessed that. So when the, there was this policeman who came to me after I was just about to leave because I saw that you know, the, the process is peaceful, people are not violated. So I was just about to leave and go to my office. The, the police approached me and requested, and first of all, she asked, are you the general secretary? I was not written that I'm a secretary, but I approached, are you the general secretary? I said, yes. Can you please tell your people to stop protesting? We want to go. And this, is, this protest of them is not granted. I passed the message to the people. The people refused to stop. Then the water cannon, they started spreading water cannon to the people, dispersing them with water cannon and, and, uh, and these rubber bullets. The people ran away. They went into shakes. Inside shakes, they, started, they were singing songs. They carry on with their struggle inside even shakes. I was standing in the pavement. Then this guy, policeman, called Vogue and Governor. He approached me 
and told me I must, I must move out of the pavement. I asked, where should I go? Because I'm a pedestrian, for heaven's sake. I have a right to be in the, ro in the, ped in the pavement, not in the road. I can't move from the road because you requested that we move from the road. I'm now standing, not even singing, not even doing anything. I'm standing, chatting with my comrades. Nothing all. We're just three of us that we're chatting. So for that, he said that, fine, if you don't want to move, it's fine. And then, I re I, then the another one, they came with, like, it was a huge mob of police come approaching me. Only me, bear in mind, three of us, they're only approaching me. And I ask, who is in charge of this, of, 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 of the delegation, the police delegation, because someone had to be in charge. It was then when, for asking that question, out of nowhere, I had a hand lifting me on top. Just when I was surprised about that, someone called my, my legs. They thrown me inside the police van like a sack of potatoes. And then Vaughan governor kicked me in, in my thigh. Uh, so you were picked up, thrown into the police van yes. and arrested immediately? Arrested immediately. Not, I was not told what charge I'm arrested for. I was not told anything. I was just thrown into the van and they told me, shut up, shut up. And they arrested me. I told them that I will not stop fighting for people's rights because you're only arresting me because I refuse to tell people to stop, which is also my right. I cannot be mandated by you. And then they arrested me. It was in front of the television, there was ATV there, there was newspapers. They took me to Keto Crest police station. That's when the drama started in Keto Crest. When I arrived there, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the station commander approached. When he approached, he said, where are these people from the protest? I, I thought you were bringing them. Because Shozi, there was a, a police from POP, Shozi, who was very nice. He said, hey, because the very same shows that untied me because I was too much arrested and it was hurting. They untied me, said like, how can they arrest a woman like this, tighten a woman like this? And, and he said, I don't know. I just responded like that to the police. Were those metal? No, not the plastic? metal, like the plastic ones. And that like they fastened me very tight. I told Walken that you're hurting me. And because of saying you're hurting me, he tightened me even much tighter to make sure that I get hurt. So when I arrived, they started uh, this station command, where's the people from the protest? And this and he goes on to and they show the respond like, No, they are still protesting. He said, Bring them here, bring them here. He went like this, bring them here. Yo, well, back in my days, I we would be touching them, touching them. And he said, Bring them here. Here we give them live ammunition. I was like, I was sitting at the back that he didn't see me. And then I was this guy came and then took me in and then wrote a statement. Within the period of 30 minutes, here comes the big VIP cars. Blue Torch, big X5 cars, the VIP and the, the ministry's uh, cars. I did not know what was happening. I don't know these people. And then I saw police like peeping in, peeping in. When I looked out, there was like VIP people coming in. There was this guy who came wearing an ANC t-shirt and an ANC jacket. Just when he was about to enter the police station, he turned back and went back to the car and took out the jacket and wore a coat. I realized that, that's when I realized there's trouble. And only to realize that the person, it was the MEC for health, Smongsen Lomo, and the MEC for, MEC for safety and security, Willis and Kuhn. Smongsen Lomo also holds the, the portfolio of being the chairperson uh, of the NC region in KZN. That's when I noticed this trouble. A private meeting was held. I saw this NC mock approaching by. Um, and then a private meeting was held with station command Ngang. After a couple of, like after 30 minutes, the, minute was, the meeting was finished. And then he left. This ANC person, there's a guy who intimidated me in, in, in who said that I should be killed with Zigote. He he showed the Willison Kuno me. He pointed at me while I was still in the police station. Uh, right there was the police was writing a statement before they took me to the cell. After that I was taken to the cell. Into a private cell, which was very stinking, with no water, no nothing. I was given food. I did not eat the food. I did not want to eat it because I was scared that it might be poisoned. So I did not eat it. I was held in this, this uh, 
uh, cell. It was only in the, in the later I, re I heard the gates and some women speaking. I had hope that if finally I won't be bored in here, some women are coming. I heard Mganga's voice saying to the other police, you must not bring in these women because this, this one, this one, this, this one that is here is a troublemaker and will, will, uh, is a troublemaker and will also badly influence, badly influence uh, other, other prisoners. So I was very kept isolated from other prisoners. They were taken to the other cells, these prisoners. And then they kept on bringing food. My lawyer came to request for a bail, police bail for me, because that's what you normally do. If people are arrested, you go and request for a police, a police station bail, which is normally like 500 rand before appearing in court. The bail was refused. They, the, state, the police uh, men said that they were, they were given a mandate not to give me any not to give me any poly, any bail so I, until I appear in court. The whole night I was there, my mom was refused to give me food until she gave me a juice. I bleeded the whole night because I have sinus. I started bleeding, I had no water to survive. I had to only sustain through the juice that my mother gave. I took the juice, I wiped my face with the juice and then I, I put it in, in tear trying to stop the blood from bleeding. You poured the juice onto your head? I poured, that was the only liquid thing I had because there was not even a droplet of water in the, in the cell. The following, I don't know whether that night I fainted how many times and I woke up how many times. I only realized when it was in the morning, my head was paining. I asked for another policeman who is like an old bed who is head, I had like, maybe could be a father to me and I asked him for some painkillers it was very nice because he took, he took his money and bought me this print and I took that this print before appearing in court. I was taken into court with the hope that, because everyone, even that man was saying that, no, you'll, you'll, you'll be free, this thing of yours, you, everyone like is always arrested for public violence if they're, if they're this thing, if they're arrested. So what was the charge against you? The charge was public violence, obstruction, and this white man came after the meeting with Mkunu. They told him that I'm the general secretary for Batali. He said they must add another case, which is incitement to commit violence. That that charge was laid to me. Bear in mind, this guy was not in the scene. But because of hearing my portfolio, I was added another charge, which I accepted. The trick part about my arrest, by the time I came, there was a sheet with my home address and my alternative address where I put my finger my fingerprints in. The following day, that, that sheet got missing. I had to do another one. I asked, where is the sheet? Because I did put my fingerprint. They said, no, the auntie who was cleaning here possibly might have thrown it away. And I had to do another one, which I accepted. I'll tell you the trick about the paper. The, when, when, I, when I was appearing in court, I was not granted a bail. I do not know the reasons behind it, but was not given a bail. I had to spend seven days in, in Westville prison. When I was released, when I was in Westville prison, strange cars was coming to my, to my house. Both my houses, that my father's house, which was an alternative address in Guamakuta, and my hometown, my, ho my, my home in Guamash. People were asking, is Bandile staying here? It was not policemen, because I expected at least police to go and verify the address. It was not policemen, it was just people who call themselves, others who call them that my, my friends. I don't have friends outside the Batlan. They wanted to know how, how I'm doing. My mom said that, she didn't know. There were strange people coming with different strange cars. My mom is too old and I asked, did you take now? She said no, because sometimes she doesn't think straight, especially that she was very stressed about my arrest. And then I was released on Sunday, I mean on Monday, with the 5,000 rent bail. I had to get an, a safe place and hide for my life because I realized those are not my friends. Those are the very people who wanted me dead. They wanted to verify the addresses where I was staying. And from then, after I was, uh, after I was released, there were like these people coming, strange people who were asking about me, where my whereabouts, to the extent that my daughter from school, she. One day, I, I look, because I, I call them every day. How old is your daughter? My daughter is six years. I call them every day. 
So my daughter said, Mommy, uh, there was a car. There was another uncle who wanted me to jump in the car and said, he's, he's your friend. I must jump in the car. And, said, and asked, what did you do? I said, I refused because you said I must not go into strangers. And there are so many of us. So I did not want to go there. And I, from there, I realized that even my kids are targeted. My family is targeted, my kids are targeted. I had to ask someone to take care of my kids, to take them to school and back from school. So you remain charged at the moment? I am still charged. Actually, I meant to appear back in court on the 14th of November, which is tomorrow. I'm appearing back into court. So what's the way forward for you and for the movement? This is not the time for us to accept the political fee. We are not meant to, to stay in this earth forever. But the bigger part about my arrest, it may gave me time to think. The seven days spent in Westville was not easy. I have long thought about it. Yes, a part of me wanted to, to let go. It was too much for me at the age of 27. To be in jail. To be in jail. First time I was arrested, kept with other prisoners who, have, who are murderers. It was too much for me. Nights, I had sleepless nights. I couldn't sleep because I didn't know what was happening. Bad news always hear about police, about the, the, uh, the jails. It was too much for me. How were you treated when you were inside prison? It, honestly, the jail is not a very good place to be. But because of me being in media, in the, in the, new, in the, in the, in the newspapers and everywhere, Smoozy God, who's my, former, who's my colleague, came to give me a paper and there were like so many people visiting me at jail. The, the warrant officer started to be conscious about the, who I am and they wanted to know more about me. Openly, I was telling them who I am, what I do for, uh, what is my position, and I talked more about Abathlan. It was only then they started to treat even all prisoners differently. But what I've heard from other prisoners, that they were always beaten. And one prisoner was beaten in front of me. They, they were, if they, they were sometimes- A woman prisoner. Yeah, they also sometimes told that they are stinking, they must go and bath and a woman, and the warrant officer stands in front of them and while they're taking a shower, making sure that it baths in a very cold water. That humiliation, it was, it was happening in front of me, I saw it. It was only in day two that things started to change. There were no more beating. Even other prisoners were like, you know, this is the first week. No, 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 we are like living smoothly. No swearing from the prisoners. No humiliation. No. You mean no swearing from the prison warrants? From, from the, yes, from the prison war uh, warrants. So it's like, for me being there in jail, it was a hard experience for me because I was scared. But yes, I was not mis uh, badly treated because they understand that I'm a human rights activist. But, this, but I brought hope and peace into the, that week brought peace to out of the prisoners because they were not violated, their rights were not violated. So it was then I realized that after I come out from prison, I will work and fight for people's rights 10 times harder than I was doing it before. Because I realized that it takes only a minute for a person to be silenced. I must not, because being in jail, I could have also been dead and I could be, I wouldn't be able to fight anymore. So while I'm still alive and having this chance, let me fight 10 times harder as I was doing it before, which I am doing at the moment. Each and every day for me is a day to make sure that people's rights are respected. It might not be overnight, but I'm sure that South Africa would be a place where everyone lives. And this is the responsibility of us as young people to make sure that we make the best of South Africa because we are the future leaders. A leader is anyone can be a leader. You don't need to be old to be a leader, but the legal that you are doing can make a difference to the nation, which is the reason why I told myself I can't let go. When I was in Brazil, I made also- You've just come back from a trip to Brazil. Of course, I just came back from a, a trip to Brazil. I spent my one week in Brazil. It was also through my activism, also through about encouraging other people, other community activists to fight because it only takes a minute for a person to be silenced. And oftentimes, we don't want to be part of the struggles because we always want to rely on our parents. And when our parents are gone, we don't know what our parents were doing. So it's very important for a young person at an early stage to know and practice their rights at an early stage for a better future. 
the ANC, which is the leading party, also did the same. It was only yeah, it was young people who brought change for the so-called democracy that is documented but not implemented. So why don't we fight, unite, and fight it together for the our constitution to be respected, for the democracy and freedom to be implemented? Why don't we fight against the democratic prison that we are living in at a young age? So that is who I am and that is what we do. I'll make sure that, because I always see South Africa not as a free country, but I always said that we are living under a democratic prison. We are still living in the apartheid era, where it was only the change of the color of the skin, but it's, things are still the same. The, the way people are oppressed is still the same. There is no difference. The violation of people's rights is still the same. The assassination of people, the recent of Marigana, just the same with the terms of the apartheid era. The demolition of people's houses, the poor people's houses, the very same in the terms of the apartheid era. So there's no difference. So we need to fight today to make the South Africa a better South Africa that Nelson Mandela stayed in 2074 because we must implement the vision of Nelson Mandela and the dream of Nelson Mandela. Mandela Mandelosi, thank you so much for joining us at Saxis. Thank you so much for welcoming me. And thank you to our viewers and listeners for joining us at the South African Civil Society Information Service. Remember, if you want more social justice news and analysis, you can get that at saxis.org.za.